a lot of people a lot of people ask me what what do I even do here and uh, I think this topic is kind of interesting for all of us and I wanted to do a little bit of qualification for myself just to explain how how do I even get here and so in the last century uh, I started um, I, I, I was attending high school, and high school got modems, these dial-in modems that were like 56K, and you would need to wait for minutes to get internet. And I was kind of intrigued how to do something on the internet, how to build something on the internet, and how to publish something. And I decided to be this lazy teacher who reads like five pages ahead of the book and then teaches everybody about the cool stuff and then reads five pages again. So I um, started Weblabor, which is a Hungarian web development community, it still exists. And I started that with a Hungarian person living in Vienna, Shandar uh, Shromkuti, who I never ever met ever since. So if he's somewhere here, that would be amazing. Um, and we started this community to share what we learned. And our idea was to learn from others, so they would share what they learned, and then the, the, then the things that we learned put together will be so much better at the end. And um, that kind of grew out to be too big. And it led me into working on the PHP documentation itself. I worked on the CHM, the Windows help version, which was, by the way, amazing. Like, you could download the whole thing and search and free text search in there and everything. It was very cool. So I worked on the build system for the PHP documentation, became the lead of the PHP documentation on the PHP.NET website. And our custom build system, we kind of grew out on the site. And then um, in 2003, we were looking for a better system. And unfortunately, 2003 is when Matt and Mike decided to fork B2 to be WordPress, so it was not yet viable for what we needed. But uh, Drupal was there, and it kind of provided all the features that we needed. So we wanted the forum, we wanted to manage users, we wanted to have posts, we wanted to have uh, fresh news, all kinds of things, feeds, we wanted to aggregate content, and it was all there. And the only thing that was not there is we wanted it to be all Hungarian, because it's a Hungarian community and people can just go and read English stuff. So our value was that we learned stuff from all over the globe and then distilled it in Hungarian and provided it back to the community. And Drupal was not really capable to be Hungarian. And I wanted even the URLs to be Hungarian, such a control freak I was. So I worked a lot on making it be able to do Hungarian and generally just to support multilingual. And so I'm working on Drupal for uh, 13 years now, and I'm still working on multilingual. So either it is a hard problem or I suck trying to solve this problem, um, or maybe both. Um, but we managed to get all the URLs Hungarian, we managed it to be Hungarian, and uh, we launched it next year. And that basically by default made me into a Drupal core developer because we needed to make those changes in the system and it was not possible to do it otherwise. So I was providing patches, fixes, and I became a Drupal core developer. And that, that led me into a lot of things uh, in Drupal through the versions. And that jumps us straight into Drupal initiatives. Because Drupal in 2003 was small and tiny, and you would submit patches on a mailing list. You would send them in as email attachments. And then they would download the email attachments and apply them from there to CVS. Uh, it was great. Uh, the Wild West. Um, but then Drupal grew out to be so big and so um, impossible to grasp at once that we needed a way to focus attention on specific things and focus work on specific things. And for Drupal 8, when Drupal 8 started in 2011, Dries Beitard, the project lead for Drupal, decided to launch these initiatives. And the idea behind them was uh, two different things. So one is to have, uh, have a roadmap that we didn't have before, that we can point people to is like, hey, we work on these shiny things, it's going to be great. And the other one was to help focus the community to work on these things and actually make them happen. And the roadmap was kind of coming uh, naturally, but to help focus on people to do things, it did not come naturally. And you would think that I was a right choice for a leading an initiative because I've, I've already had like these nine years of experience with Drupal and even more with open source and the PHP team and everything. but. I was not naturally right for the job. So I was selected for the multilingual initiative in 2001, May something, start of May. And one year into the multilingual initiative, I think I made my biggest mistake because another initiative was announced, Views in Core. 
And views is the most popular thing in Drupal. It allows you to take the data from Drupal and then generate whatever output out of that you want. Feeds, REST endpoints, or tables, or galleries, or pagers, or whatever you want, sliders. It doesn't matter. So it's a query builder and an output generator. And it was four times more popular than any multilingual module ever. They got money, they got funding, they've had a stable team. Some of that team was people who worked on the multilingual initiative before, and I totally felt betrayed. People were stolen from my team. They got money. They've had funding. They were focused. They were um, four times more popular than what I was working on. So I've sent out this very angry email to everybody in Drupal leadership that I will probably be unable to continue this. And it's, it's just bad, and, and, and I don't see a way out, and it's impossible. And I think they were very smart, because they did not reply to any of my feelings. They replied to some of the facts that I included in the email, but totally ignored all of the feelings, and let me to ferment in that thing, and to figure it out for myself. And what I figured out is I was totally approaching that from the wrong side. So what I was seeing is that Drupal is this very delicious, nice, small pie that we are chipping away from. And if they steal my people, then I will have less people. And if they steal money from the pool, then I will have less money. And that's not how it is, OK? Because there's always more people to come. There's always more people to come to this event. There's always more people to watch the live stream. There's always more people to watch the videos later on. And they are all interested in where things are going. And a lot of them are interested in contributing to the project. The thing is, we usually don't do a very good job of attracting them, even in Drupal. So I realized that I need to grow this pie instead of thinking it, about it as a fixed pie, and try to figure out how to grow this pie and to make people happy uh, be on my team. So my problem was that I did not have enough money. So I could get some money for some things, events, some food, maybe a flight ticket or two, but I didn't have sustained money to work with 1,300 people for four years. That was impossible to fund on this scale, right? So what I wanted to figure out is if I don't have money and I want to work in the classic open source fashion where uh, people contribute on their own time and for their own benefit, now, how can we make that happen, and how can we scale that out? So I went in and did a lot of research on how can you make people happy. How can you make people come and see that what you do is great and enjoy staying with you? And even if they leave, they would regret that they left. <clears throat> so I went in and did a lot of that research. And one of the things I found is if you try to focus on making people successful in different ways, then they will find their, way, their place in your um, initiative. So Demping did a lot of um, um, writing on this. And he has a great book called Drive that I suggest you read. And he line, lines out these three things as the main drivers behind what drives people to make things happen. The first is that autonomy. It's the way to, to, uh, to choose your way and to make your ideas happen and to have ownership over things. The second is mastery, to improve in something. And the third is purpose, to find, find a reason, find a, a higher purpose that you join to. And we did a lot of things in these areas that only clicked later on when I read the literature that it kind of made sense that we did some of these things. So it's not like I, I architected the initiative around this system, but in hindsight, it makes a lot of sense to explain it like this. And purpose is kind of easy for you as well, but it's not that hard for Drupal. Also, because multilingual Drupal powers a lot of things. So if you use games, Unity 3D, their website is totally multilingual Drupal. If you are interested in education, children, uh, immigrants, et um, refugees, etc., then uh, UNESCO runs on multilingual Drupal. If you're interested in disseminating science and findings and physics, then the CERN runs on multilingual Drupal. If you are interested in technology and saving the planet, uh, then Tesla runs on multilingual Drupal as well. And these companies can kind of pay their way to have those solutions. Right, so they can make things happen however complicated it is. And they could do it even if it was, even if it was impossibly hard and would take a long time. What I was more interested in and what gave me purpose is the small sites, like this site, GoGoBoard, 
is, uh, is an initiative to have tools to get kids into technology and have them interact with technology to understand how, how it operates and have them tinker with all kinds of things. And they run a multilingual Drupal as well. So what I like is if we improve the experience, then we don't only improve them for these big sites, but we improve them for everyone. And especially what we did in Drupal 8 is just to make it clicky simple to do everything multilingual and don't need to download anything to make it happen. So these folks will be able to do it much easier and basically uh, make their um, world a better place. So that's, I think, is uh, equally simple if you look at wh where WordPress can go and where WordPress already went. What's much harder to deal with is uh, autonomy. Uh, and as yesterday, the, uh, Matt said in the Q&A, or Matt was questioned in the Q&A if he should make more decisions, I think that's the wrong answer. Because if you ask the leader to make all the decisions, then you don't get to choose your way. Then it becomes the day job where you are told what to do, you don't choose your way. What the leader needs to do is set up high-level goals and then give you enough autonomy to figure out the rest. So what was great for me is the multilingual initiative was so huge that I couldn't oversee it at all. And I basically needed to take, off, uh, um, take rid of ownership of a lot of things because I couldn't do it anyway. And I basically ended up with uh, delegating that responsibility to a lot of people. So if you agree on the high-level goals, then people can take ownership of the, of the layer below that and figure out how is it going to happen. And even if it's not going to happen the way you wanted to implement it originally, uh, it's going to happen. So if you have an attachment to specific implementations and ways to do things, and you want to implement it that way, then you are limited to the power that you personally, one person, has to make that happen. If you give up that ownership and say, yeah, go there, but I don't know how, then you'll get there, and it may not be the way you want it, but you'll get there, and it will happen. So much easier to scale. And then the other thing is our open source projects grow so big now that they are very scary. Everybody says here to come to the contributor days, but if it would be a contributor day where it's like everyone together and do funky things, it wouldn't work. Because we need to set up these small spaces that are safe to people to go, and they feel like they belong to somewhere. Belonging to WordPress or Drupal is such a huge thing, it's very hard to, to to, to do anything tactile with that. But belonging to a small group, a tribe, or however you want to call it, is much easier to deal with. So what we found in the initiative is if we've had regular meetings, if we've had a website where people could go to, if we've had a list of people who are working on the initiative, like list them all, and if we've had a textual medium for meetings that was very inclusive for everyone in the multilingual scene who would not be able to speak so fast in English, that was very inclusive and very enabling for people to come and have that safe environment. And once you have that, you need to ensure that things are going to happen even if single people for some reason fail, go away, or cannot figure it out for themselves. So nothing is going to happen if one person works on something. Because there's always need to be a reviewer, right? There's always need to be someone who commits it. So if we set that up at the start, if we make them work together, then they can fail much faster, figure out what's wrong early, uh, fix it, and then they have a much better chance to move forward. It's also, I don't know if you've, if you've put together furniture or something, it always feels better if you do it with multiple people. It's not just like you doing your, your thing, okay? And then you need to plan for a succession. So what I've said is I've had people I delegated um, different parts of the initiative to, but all of them through these four years have had personal life events that made them unable to fulfill the, uh, their tasks at the time. So the thing is they built teams uh, around them themselves as well so they can jump in and own things um, when they need it to go away. And then once things actually get done, very important to praise their work. If you don't praise work, it's kind of the same as if you, if you just, like, if you ignore them entirely. So you need to celebrate every single accomplishment. The more you celebrate people's accomplishment, the more they will feel valued and understood, 
and that their thing moves the needle forward. And if you have that goal defined and celebrate the steps there, then they will see that they are making the contribution to the final goal, to the big um, initiative that should happen. And the other thing is you should praise time off. Because if somebody goes off from your, um, from your work, they probably go off already late. They probably burned out two months before. But they were kind of sticking around because they had this responsibility. Um, and now they finally go away, which they should. They should have rest. They should go away and have some time for themselves. And you should praise them because it's, it's good for them to do that. And they may or may not come back at the end. If you praise them, they may actually come back because how friendly you were, right? But if they don't come back, at least you've had a nice goodbye. So I think you should praise uh, both hard work and time off and uh, value your people that way as well. And for a personal story, two years ago, I woke up um, and started having breakfast with, with my wife and we never finished that breakfast because she started having some strong pains in her stomach. And it went so strong that we needed to go to the ER to get examined, and they didn't know what it is. And they were examining her for five hours straight, and they kind of figured out that the blood results are getting worse and worse, but there is no blood anywhere. So that means that she had internal bleeding. And she was, uh, she was about to die in a few hours, if not operated. So they collected a group of doctors to operate her that night, 11 p.m., and they operated her and they uh, saved her life that night. And she lives and now we have a kid, so it's amazing. But these are the kind of things that you cannot plan for, they just happen. And you may, done, you may not even know why, but they just happen. But the thing is, if you do those things right that I've talked about before, then you're going to have the support network that already understands the goals, that already has um, all the stuff to work on, and they're just going to do it. And you can go away and do your stuff and have your life uh, restored. So that's what I did. And at the same time, DrupalCon Austin was happening, and they sent me this photograph and uh, sent us private messages, sent us flowers and all kinds of stuff. So it was just amazing to feel that support and to see that everything that I planned to do in Austin happened because we shared all those responsibilities. And finally, mastery is, uh, I think, easy because people always want to get better at things and you always want to have more people to work on things. You just need to match those two. So one of the things we did is being radically open about all the things that we did. We built a, we built a workshop about multilingual Drupal that we've had a 23-page handout that said, click here, write this, click here, write this, click here, write this. We video recorded that. We've had a di Drupal distribution that con contained all the things. And then people just took that and translated that to Spanish and delivered it in Spain, took that, translated that to one of the Indian languages and delivered it in India, and just basically took this everywhere on the globe. And that's because we just published it and we put it there and like do whatever you want. And the same thing we did with user testing. We created the script, we put it up for people to uh, test, and a lot of people took it for themselves and did the user testing. I did a lot of reading on, a um, lot more reading on things to do to get people, um, get people active. And one of the stories I found is about car wash loyalty. So there's a lot, there was some research into having a car wash loyalty card with 10 empty slots and a car wash loyalty card with uh, 10 empty slots and two stamp stamped in already and eight empty slots, okay? And the 10 empty slot version already stamped in uh, worked twice as good as the eight empty slot version, although they were the same amount of slots. So what they did there is basically made you feel like you're on your way of collecting car wash loyalty points, right? So you were on your way and you kind of felt this urge to complete that uh, way. So I translated that to blog posts. And what I decided to do is I wrote blog posts about different aspects of how multilingual Drupal is going. And then at the end, I presented, by the way, it doesn't actually work perfectly. Here are the issues that you can help with. And that basically made people to understand that, oh, this is progressing well. But OK, well, I still need some work. 
And then they could just go in and help there, and that worked wonders. So there's a lot of these things that you can do. But generally, overall, what you need to understand is open source is not one small fixed pie. You need to grow this pie. You need to always look for growing this pie, because people will have their life events. People will burn out. Uh, people will start working on other things, new shiny technologies, whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, and your project will only sustain if you keep looking for new people and keep looking for their interests that match with your interests. And that way, we managed to attract 1,300 people, uh, including the long tail of everyone who contributed ever to issues, reported problems, or whatever else. So if you want to learn more about these things, then I suggest these books. Chip and Dan Heath Switch is amazing. So if this is the only thing you take away from this talk, Chip and Dan Heath Switch. Uh, Dan Pick Drive and David Marque Turn the Ship Around is very good for handing off um, uh, autonomy. He's a, he's a nuclear reactor captain who handed off a lot of, a lot of a responsibility on his ship, and that's kind of pretty scary. So it's a very good book to read for that as well. And that's it for my talk. Thank you.